morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to come uh, and speak to you, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about a lot of the fantastic projects that have been going on in your community groups and across Scotland. Um, I was a little bit late getting my title uh, to E, for which I apologise. You can see it there now, Engaging the Past and the Present, Ethics, Challenges and Opportunities. So um, I, I want to sort of use this opportunity to um, in part tell a few stories on myself, um, some experiences, and to um, ask some questions that I think all of you already are asking. Maybe that will uh, prompt some discussion as we go along. So I'm actually going to start with a quote from a good friend and colleague uh, who stated in an article um, that uh, in his estimation, archaeology is neither particularly useful nor necessary, uh, but it is intellectual fun. I agree with the fun part, uh, and I suspect all of you too do too, uh, but I think that there are uh, uses uh, for archaeology. Uh, archaeology is always put to some kind of a use. Uh, all of us are doing it in this room in our various projects. Um, some uses can be quite nefarious, as we've seen in the news um, of late, and others can be quite positive. Um, so these ideas of how we use archaeology, how we situate it in the present day, is something that um, I've thought quite a lot about and continue to think about. Um, some of those um, challenges are ethical conundrums, if you like, uh, in terms of how we practice archaeology in the present and what we do with it. Uh, and the real question for me uh, in one of those blooms there is that relationship between the past and the present. Uh, what, where do our responsibilities lie? Do they lie in, with the communities that we work with today and how they might uh, get something from the archaeology? Or do our responsibilities lie with the people from the past whose stories we've taken on the mantle of telling. Uh, so that balance is, is, is a challenging one. Um, so I hope you will indulge me a bit uh, this morning because I thought I would, when I was thinking about this and what I wanted to talk about, I reflected back on a lot of projects that I've had the good fortune to be involved in. So I just want to talk about a few of those because in different ways they raise some of these major questions. Uh, and here I really, I, I'm begging your forbearance because I'm taking you um, to the other side of the Atlantic, okay? I will come back to Scotland uh, later in the talk, uh, as well as the north of Ireland, but I want to start in a sort of strange place um, that some of you may have visited, um, which is the Chesapeake um, in eastern North America, and it's a location, as you can see from all those signs there, of the first permanent English New World settlement at Jamestown, 1607, a uh, place where Colonial Williamsburg is, a um, very well-known museum, and a place that gets a lot of capital out of that idea of being colonial. Uh, colonial is a, a very good thing there, and you can use it to sell pancakes as well as cars and houses and all kinds of other things. Um, and it's where I got my own start um, in archaeology. And I did a lot of work actually digging at Jamestown, looking at the 17th century site, but prior to running that archaeological work, um, this, this is the part where I show really deeply embarrassing photographs of myself. Uh, so uh, that's one way to start the day. But my perspective on the colonial archaeology in a place like uh, Williamsburg and Jamestown was very much shaped by working at um, a museum and doing living history and working alongside um, contemporary members of, of Powhatan tribes, um, uh, Virginia Indians, which they prefer to be called. Um, and these, um, uh, today's uh, Indian groups, um, while they may have had reservations in Virginia for 400 years, do not enjoy federal recognition, um, which is, uh, reasons for that are long and complicated, which I won't go into, um, but it has put them on the outs um, for a long time, so that much of their message to people in this outdoor museum, in their communities, uh, is simply the message that we're still here. And archaeology comes into this and comes into their contemporary narrative, that use of archaeology, because what emerged from this early colonial settlement is that rather than it just being about English people relocating in another part of the world, the, the American narrative, the birthplace of America, which is what you get if you visit uh, Jamestown, Actually, what you see in the archaeology is a dominance of native materials, clearly demonstrating that the English settlers were entirely reliant upon uh, the food and goodwill for a time of their native neighbors. And that becomes quite powerful in the present for those tribes who are simply trying to prove that they are still uh, around. And through this, over the last 20 years, a number of uh, Virginia Indians have actually um, not just worked alongside archaeologists, but actually become archaeologists themselves. 
um, and a number of the monkey Indians uh, are also professional um, archaeologists. And just this past summer in July, they were successful in the, after 20 years of trying in gaining federal recognition. And part of that was actually being able to look at the archaeological record, which demonstrated their continuity uh, and the identity of their community. So there's an example of a particular kind of use uh, of archaeology uh, that was, I would say, true to what happened in the past, what it shows us about those early relations, but was also quite valuable uh, in the present in the recognition efforts of the Pamunkey. A number of other tribes are trying to do the same thing um, as I speak. But lest um, we get, or I get too congratulatory about the role that archaeology can play and that we, you know, doing community archaeology, I think we, we very much value the notion that the more voices, the better, and inclusivity is a good thing. Uh, but sometimes it might not be. Uh, and this is a sort of light, slightly light relief moment, uh, which is a, one of the worst months of my entire life in, I think it was 1993 or 1994, which was the Bruton Parish excavation, where we went into a churchyard and tried to correct the damage done by uh, a group of um, uh, amateur archeologists who were digging in the churchyard, trying to find the lost vault of Sir Francis Bacon, which apparently contained the keys to Utopia. <laughs> they didn't find it, we didn't find it, and they concluded that we'd just taken it away. But in the course of their excavations, they damaged a lot of human remains. So total inclusivity maybe isn't always uh, the best thing. Another quick uh, Virginia example, um, something else that I was privileged to be involved in. Uh, what you're looking at there is Shenandoah National Park up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and American national parks um, uh, don't let people live in them. Uh, and so when this park was created in the 1930s, it required um, the removal of about 500 families. Um, so many thousand people uh, were removed from their homes and uh, relocated elsewhere to turn this land back into, uh, back into nature. And it was justified at the time quite easily because of prevailing assumptions and stereotypes about the kinds of people who live in places like the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, and I'm sure you all have those images um, in your mind of hillbillies and deliverance and all the rest of that. And in the 1930s, a study, an official academic study, was actually done in this region um, by a sociologist um, and a journalist uh, called Holofolk. And it, in essence, uh, presented the folks living in the Blue Ridge as living a medieval life, um, not of the 20th century, having never heard the Lord's Prayer, the children didn't go to school, they had no shoes all of that, and this was a, a study, and that was used in part to justify the removals. The archaeology, on the other hand, shows something entirely different. Um, so, you know, not only were these folks uh, living in the 20th century, uh, they might have been living in the 25th century, given finds of things like toy ray guns um, and all kinds of up-to-date things, and even things like soap dishes. So, in fact, actually, they were washing and shoes, they did have shoes. Uh, being slightly uh, facetious here, but this was actually ended up being very, very significant for the families and for some of the people who were displaced and for their children, their descendants. Um, and I was able to do a lot of oral history as part of this project, bring people back to um, their home sites, Leona Dyer Brown there sitting where her front porch used to be, and get their perspective. Uh, and then subsequently that fed into uh, what's now a permanent uh, exhibit in the park about the lives of the people uh, who lived there. And that really, most of that came out of the archaeological records, seeing what was actually there, and then inviting people to actually tell their own stories and marry that together. So another case where um, there's a positive outcome from that engagement uh, with the archaeology, but there also were choices that had to be made. So for example, the families were very happy when I could tell stories about uh, the technologies they used and how you know, they have cars and they went out and all those more positive stories, but they didn't like me telling the stories which I could see in the documentation in the ground about the fact that there was once slavery in this part of Virginia, and that was less of um, a valuable story for them in the present. So as the archaeologist, I had to make a choice about what stories to tell. And I did tell the story about the enslaved people who lived there because that was important, um, even if the people in the present didn't necessarily want to hear that. So it's that tension that I was referencing. Coming back to uh, this side of the Atlantic, a uh, slightly different place in time, um, Apple Island, County Mayo, uh, some of you may know it, um, and I uh, was fortunate to work there for a few summers in, uh, on the slopes of Sleemore Mountain, uh, where there is a very well-known deserted settlement of over 70-some houses. And it's, a, it's quite an evocative place, which hopefully you can see from the slide, and it's a place that people often go um, and um, 
I suppose to try to, to experience some of Ireland's more turbulent history, particularly the famine period. Uh, so the deserted village there is, is widely presented and understood to have been uh, deserted as the result of uh, the famine in the 1840s. But actually that's not what the archaeology says. And the archaeology actually indicated that it was still being um, in use into the 20th century and certainly uh, permanently occupied through the 19th century. And that story has sort of been set aside. Um, and this project is one that I, that I joined. It had been running for a number of years, but it had been running in a very uh, sort of traditional archaeological manner, which was basically you just get on and you do it, and you bring in students and you do it. You don't actually engage that much locally or talk to people. So the first uh, summer I was there, we actually implemented an open day, which was simply inviting people to come to see what was going on. And there was a very big response, um, and I'm sure all of you have experienced this too, lots of people interested in seeing, and lots of stories being shared. Um, but one thing that emerged is that actually, even though the evidence for the continuity of use in that village you know, post day in the famine was pretty clear and people accepted it, when you look at a place like Apple Island, which is dependent upon the tourist industry, it's one of the things that people come to see. So overturning the story of that village actually challenges other needs in the present, which are economic needs, right? Uh, so that project has stopped and is actually looking at other sites on the island and, and sort of leaving uh, the village alone for now while people uh, and descendants of people uh, from that village, I suppose, come to terms and decide what stories they want to tell about it. But in the meantime, it is an economic draw to the location. So again, conflicts and tensions and, and challenges in how we approach the archaeology. Uh, and that finally brings me back around to Scotland um, and to um, a project or series of projects that I've been fortunate to be associated with in the last number of years, along with other folks um, in this room, uh, John Raven for one, uh, across there. Um, and this is a sort of, a, I suppose, a, a loose network um, of people drawn from a number of different institutions, uh, academic, public, uh, etc., really trying to look at ways in which we can address that issue of economic development, of sustainability, um, of resilience, uh, of working with communities, of trying to balance those different needs um, and expectations and what we want to get from these kinds of partnerships. Um, and it's taking archaeology away from being that sort of you know, intellectually fun exercise that has no contemporary relevance or use to something that is very much embedded in the kinds of conversations that people are having around the planet now, all about resilience um, and sustainability. Where does heritage fit in that? Where does archaeology fit in that? And again, I know these topics are going to come up over and over again um, today in different um, places um, and different projects. And just looking around the room earlier, I can see those conversations taking place. So it's us trying to uh, work across a range of, of people um, and, and institutions to address these particular um, challenges. One of the um, elements of our recent work has been working closely with the Colin Say and RNC Her Heritage Trust um, as they're looking for ways of um, exploring and embedding the heritage of their island as part of economic sustainability because of course in a small island environment that is the key concern for everyone. Um, and it, you know, it's been very, very productive because as you know, as a university academic, you know, I have certain research questions I'm interested in looking at sites on that island connectivity, but it's a lot more interesting to do it in concert with people who have other uh, needs for that work. And it, it uh, raises different questions and makes, um, certainly makes me think differently about what I'm doing and where it sits. So I want to um, uh, wrap up now with a few um, uh, comments on, uh, I suppose, what has, um, what would be the core of my own uh, research right now in practice, and that is looking at uh, and engaging communities in a fairly contested history in Northern Ireland, looking at the archaeology of the plantation <laughs> period, which is um, certainly popularly understood to be the root of contemporary division um, in the North of Ireland. And so how do we actually look at the archaeology of the 16th and 17th centuries? Um, we can't look at it without acknowledging the present day resonances. So how might we use it in a positive way? And so owing to a whole series of anniversaries over the last number of years relating to plantation, uh, 1613, 2013 town charters, et cetera, et cetera, 1609 launch of the Ulster plantation, uh, we've tried to work with a range of different um, 
uh, bodies and communities to uh, bring uh, our academic understanding of what happened in this period to a wider audience. Um, and to make a, um, a long, complicated story short, what happened in the early 17th century was actually quite complicated. Uh, and it's not just a straight tension between incoming settlers um, and Irish on the ground. It's much more nuanced, lots more evidence of, of engagement and, and entanglement, if you like, in that period. And that becomes quite powerful in the present when you can actually present evidence or share evidence of a certain amount of sharing in the past uh, in the present to reflect. So you see some of those quotes there. I and mean, the one that always sort of make, wakes me up in the middle of the night and makes me shake a bit is the one that from just a, a one anonymous um, participant in one of these programs, how by involving archaeologists they can exert such influence, uh, which is um, it's quite a responsibility to have. One of the things we've done, which Robert Corbett will talk about uh, a bit after, um, after my paper, is engaging um, different community groups within the actual excavation process. Uh, so rather than me standing up saying, this is what I think this stuff means, believe me, you know, I'm the academic, people actually get to discover stuff for themselves and then and be confronted maybe with contradictory evidence and have to decide what that actually means. It's not for me to control that or to tell people what it means. Every individual has to decide what the significance is. And those programs have been quite successful, um, but they're by and large working with local history groups, people who are already open uh, to some of these um, uh, changing narratives. So we wanted to go uh, sort of another step further and started working with uh, Corey Miele, which is a Peace and Reconciliation Center, so 50 years of, of working across the community divide. Uh, and it's very helpful as an archaeologist to actually have the support of somebody who is a professional facilitator and knows what they're doing, uh, as opposed to an archaeologist trying to uh, do this kind of work. So we've been uh, doing residential programs, uh, so weekends spent at the Corey Miller Center in Valley Castle, uh, with different um, sort of target groups and, and targeting so-called harder to reach groups. This might be um, you know, economically challenged or former paramilitaries or people who experienced uh, troubles related violence. So we mix and match a bit of artifact handling, a bit of discussions and history sessions and uh, visits to a number of sites to look at the sort of complicated history uh, of the period. Uh, so we've taken to places like Mavanaher, which was an a, a English um, plantation settlement, um, Mercer's Company, the London Dairy Plantation, a place that's supposed to have no Irish whatsoever, but yet the archaeological evidence shows the English living in Irish style houses, using Irish pottery, and clearly there's interaction there. Um, which is informative in the present, um, whatever people choose to do with that. Um, we also take them to uh, Dungiven Priory in Bonn, which is a very um, complex, interesting site, ecclesiastical site, then it becomes uh, an O'Cahan um, tower house, um, so Irish Gaelic, uh, Centre of Irish Gaelic Lordship, and then that's converted into an English plantation in Bonn. But through all those changes, um, the effigy tomb, the very famous effigy tomb, was retained within um, the priory itself, even with the English planters there, who would have certainly been under a certain amount of expectation and pressure to destroy any of these sorts of uh, icons associated with Catholicism, but it was retained. So people can go in there, we have the key, we get in there, most visitors can't get in there, and they can touch that tomb, and they can ask the question, why is it still here? What does that say about cultural relations in the past? What might it say about present? Uh, and then the participants go back and they have um, this amazing sort of session. They sit around like small children cutting up uh, bits of newspaper and photographs taken um, during the day. And in small groups, they just they come up with posters that reflect what they learned or didn't like or liked uh, and just reflecting. And then the next morning, we would gather together and look at some of these posters. Uh, and I have to say, I have been absolutely astonished and humbled um, by the, the amount of thought and effort that's gone into these um, and the ways in which uh, different groups are actually um, challenging themselves to engage. Perfect. Um, so this is just one example there uh, from one group, which was really it was coming from um, a, a very strongly uh, loyalist area, economically challenged area in Belfast, um, Shankel. And they were absolutely thirsting to learn about this period and to be challenged in terms of what they thought it had meant and what their place was in relation. So it's been very exciting um, to be involved in it uh, and again raises a lot of those questions about how we position ourselves and how we decide what's most important, um, the past or the present. So you'll be grateful to know that this is my last slide um, and it really is sort of a, um, a personal reflection in a sense where on the one hand I am um, a professional scientific archaeologist, um, I am also as an archaeologist um, by nature a storyteller, but I'm also a citizen. Uh, and so for me, being a citizen living in Northern Ireland, um, it's very important for me to participate 
in trying, you know, in, in conflict transformation, in peace building, in making a better society. And I can do that with the tools that I have, which is uh, the archaeology, but I always have to be mindful that I am using the stories of people in the past for that present day purpose. So, thank you very much.